Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you. And I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles to the book of Revelation and chapter two. And we're going to read the first seven verses of uh, these letters to the seven churches. This is the first letter to the church at Ephesus. And we want to see what the Lord has to say to the church that was left its first love. So it says in verse one, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy lampstand out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. We were talking last time, it seems a long time ago, but we were talking about uh, these seven churches in a general sense and some of the common features and I, I didn't get to finish that, so I want to just mention just a few more things about them in general before we look at this particular church in, in, in particular. And so a dispensational note, first of all, on the seven churches. It's interesting that in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, we know the scripture well, uh, but I want to read it, 1 Peter 4, verse 17. We, we have this interesting statement by the apostle Peter. It says this, it says, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And so what you find in the book of Revelation, it is a book primarily about judgment. And we're going to see that he is going to begin uh, the Lord himself walking amongst the churches, assessing and judging beginning with the house of God. And then from there, he's going to move out and he's going to judge both the Jewish world, uh, the time, what we call the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, they're going to come under the judgment of God. And then not just the Jewish world, but also the Gentile world. They're going to have a very technical term in the book of Revelation called the earth dwellers. Nevertheless, he's going to deal with them. And so the three groups of people that as far as God is concerned, uh, as he looks at this world, he sees three distinct groups of people, and all three of them are going to come under divine judgment. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, names these three groups. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So all three groupings are going to come under assessment and judgment uh, from the Lord himself. And so what's interesting is that we begin with judgment beginning at the house of God. And the first, well, chapter two and chapter three deals with Christ assessing and judging in the house of God. What is interesting is that after chapter three, you will not find the, the mention of the church again in the book of Revelation. Now, what we will see is the bride uh, in chapter 19, but no reference to the church. Uh, there are people who will trust Christ during that time frame. Uh, but uh, one of the, I think, clearest evidences for a pre-tribulation rapture is the absence of any reference to the church in Revelation 6 through 19. You're just not going to find it. And so we'll point that out as we go through, but it's very significant. And it would seem to me that the church is gone during those seven years. It is in heaven 
in the presence of the Lord. So what is uh, his judgment or assessment of the church? What we're going to see is that for each of the seven churches, there it begins with a, a vision of the glorified Christ. Some aspect of that vision in chapter one is seen in each church. Now, it's just different aspects, but we're going to see something, some aspect of the vision of the glorified Christ taken from uh, Revelation 1, 12 through 18. And so it seems clear that whatever's lacking in that church, Christ is the answer. Glorified Christ is the answer. The risen Christ has everything needed for each assembly and each problem encountered. And maybe the church that is being dealt with has forgotten some aspect of his character and needs a reminder of it. And so just interesting that we're going to look at that, the vision we saw in chapter one, we're going to see it, a little aspect of it in each of the seven churches. Second thing, just in a general sense, is the Lord addresses each letter to these seven churches with the statement, I know. And of course, the risen Christ is the all-knowing one, and he does know the true condition of each assembly. Uh, we might have looked at these assemblies, like I'm, as we look at Ephesus today, I'm thinking, wow, that sounds like a great assembly. I would love to be in fellowship in an assembly like that one. And yet the Lord sees something that we might not have seen at first glance. And again, he knows. He knows the true condition of each assembly. And of course, he knows the true condition of our assemblies. Uh, he sees uh, maybe what we don't see, uh, but he sees very clearly. Also, uh, we mentioned already, but uh, he has something against five of the seven churches. And you'll hear this phrase, I have somewhat against thee. And uh, again, it's repeated throughout five of the seven. Uh, we've already mentioned that 70% of them uh, actually needed to repent. The only two churches that get no rebuke from the Lord are Smyrna, the persecuted church, and Philadelphia, the church of the open door. These are the only ones that get no rebuke from the Lord. Each letter has a word of encouragement and a promise for the overcomer or the conqueror. Remember that word, uh, Nikeo or Nike, from which, uh, you know, kind of the idea of victor. And so the overcomer uh, is given a word of encouragement. Now, we have to kind of figure out about who are these overcomers and uh, and what, what does it really mean? And I just want you to go back with me to 1 John 5 and verse 5. And John, who wrote um, this first epistle, the first epistle of John, uh, he uses the word overcomer, and so we, we can certainly conclude that as uh, the Lord Jesus writes to the overcomer, uh, John has this understanding who this overcomer is. Uh, what does it really mean? First John 5 and verse uh, 5, uh, we, we read this. It says, who is he that overcometh or gets the victory that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, even previous verse, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so what we can see is that the overcomer uh, is a true believer. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God, and he has victorious faith. He believes in the Lord. It, it's faith that is the well, there's a great hymn we often sing, faith is the victory, faith is the victory, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And so true faith is victorious, no matter what the general church scene is. So the true believer, no matter how bleak the church scene is, he can still walk in victory. And isn't that wonderful to know that no matter how bleak the church scene is, we've seen a lot of decline in North America, we can still walk in victory. And the Lord sees that and has a word of encouragement for the true overcomer. Now, final uh, remark about, well, two more remarks about in general about these churches. Um, there's a, in each of the churches, there's kind of a, what we'd call a catchphrase. And it's a, it's a contrasting ideas or terms. So we're going to see in this church, 
the, the big contrasting words are love and hate. They, they've left their first love. They hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. So two things that are set in stark contrast, love and hate, go together in this letter. Uh, when we look at the church at Smyrna, we're going to see the same idea. Two key words that are going to set in contrast. Look at verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So you've got poverty and riches, right? So you see these love and hate, kind of opposites, poverty and riches, opposites. Uh, we're going to see that in chapter uh, 2, verse 13 and 14. The next one is holding and casting. Uh, so to hold something, to cast something. Again, they're, they're opposites. You either hold something or you cast it away. And so we see it in verse 13. I know thy works where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. Even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to high idols. They got holding and casting. And then in verse 19, the next church, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. So again, contrast, first and last uh, concerning this church. Chapter 3, verse 1, again, these startling contrasts in this catchphrase. 3, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. And so, again, what a contrast, living and dead. <laughs> they, they've got this reputation, they're alive, but they're dead. And so, again, just these, ca these contrast words, they really help us. And then when we get to uh, the next one, verse 8 of Revelation 3, we notice, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And again, distinct opposites, open and shut. And so again, that would be the key word. And when we go to Laodicea, uh, it's in verse 15, but you don't even need to go there because you know it, it's hot and cold. Again, two opposites, right? Uh, and and we we see uh, again, verse 15, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would they were because I were cold or hot. So that's just an interesting thing to consider. That, and it's helpful to kind of remember the seven churches. If you can get a hold of these catchphrases, you'll be able to remember details of those churches. Love and hate, poverty and riches, holding and casting, last and first, living and dying, open and shut, hot and cold. The final thing in general about these churches is that there is an Old Testament background that seems to be in each of the churches. And again, remember our New Testament writers, they cut their teeth on the Old Testament, and so often the Old Testament bleeds through. And we're going to see, as we look at this first church, we're going to see Genesis, and we're going to see the Garden of Eden. We, we've already saw it in the reading. There's a mention of the Tree of Life. But there's other allusions to the Garden of Eden in this first letter, which we will point out as we go. And we'll see that. I'm not going to point out the other ones for the other churches yet, but we'll see them as we go through. That the back of the writer's mind, there's an Old Testament allusion to passages that we'd be familiar with that seem to come through the text. So Ephesus, the backsliding church, what do we know about it? Well, let's start by talking a little bit about the city of Ephesus, because this is to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? So what do we know about this city? Well, it was a tremendous commercial center. It was on a major east-west highway. Uh, Ephesus was the most influential city in the province of Asia, with a population of approximately 200,000 people. Uh, it was a very wealthy city, uh, a free city, 
uh, did not have Roman troops stationed there, garrisoned there. It, it had its own form of democratic government. It was an assize town. Uh, the, the assizes is where you would have Roman justice carried out. And so a Roman governor would come and he would hear cases. Uh, and so it was a, a, a town that was known for the assizes that would take place. It was also a place where the Pan-Ionian Games took place there as well. So this, when we think of the Olympics, well, this is one of the sites where uh, these kind of games, the Pan-Ionian Games would take place. But the most striking thing about the city of Ephesus was the temple of Diana. Remember, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Well, this temple of Diana, it took 220 years to finally complete. It was built in three stages, three, if you like, incarnations of it, uh, initial building, and then it was expanded, and then it was expanded again. And all this took 220 years. Uh, the last incarnation of it, it was considered to be a wonder of the ancient world. At the time of uh, Jesus writing to this church, it, ha it had... 127 pillars. These pillars were studded with jewels. I mean, it was just absolutely magnificent. And Diana was the goddess of fertility. So part of what went on there was temple prost prostitution. There was great lewdness connected with Diana worship. Uh, we often tend to think of how immoral our time in history is. And we, we forget that there were times in the ancient world where things that we've come to kind of uh, see in our culture were just even connected with worship in the cultures of those days. And so it was just dominated by immorality. And also, uh, as well as immorality, uh, the great uh, superstition. You could, you could buy copies of the Ephesian letters. Now, I'm not talking about Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, but the Ephesian letters were six words that were kind of a magical incantation that if you said this, it would bring you prosperity and good luck. And so they were called, and you can look it up online. I looked it up myself on Google. You can look up and see about these, uh, these good luck charms, the Ephesian letters. Uh, I prefer Paul's Ephesian letter uh, myself to these uh, superstitious ones. Uh, but but that's it was again. I remember when Paul went to Ephesus. Remember they had the great Ephesian bonfire. And part of it was they burned these magical books. And a lot of them had these incantations in them, and they burned them. Uh, it was quite uh, the event. It was also uh, the Temple of Diana was a place of asylum. It was similar to what we consider the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. And so people that were trying to escape uh, the rule of law could go to the Temple of Diana and claim asylum. Asylum. And so it's it's remarkable, really, in such a wicked city, uh, such a immoral, superstitious city, that the Apostle Paul was able to see a tremendous work done there. And the church at Ephesus had a wonderful heritage. Paul labored there for three years uh, on his third missionary journey, and he taught them the whole counsel of God. Just look back to Acts chapter 20. Uh, this church... I would say, had more in-depth teaching from Paul than any other church in the New Testament because he spent longer there than he did, as far as we know, than, than at any other church. In Acts 20, uh, just a couple of references, verse 31, he says, I have, uh, verse, verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And then back in verse 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And Paul's ministry was so effective in that city that it almost put out of business the worship of Diana. And again, we, we think of uh, Acts chapter 19. Uh, we remember the, the great riot caused by the silversmiths 
because uh, their their livelihood was threatened because uh, idle uh, purchases plummeted. Uh, uh, the the idle making industry uh, took a nosedive on the stock market because of Paul's labors. It was amazing, really. And then they had this big bonfire uh, where they got rid of all their magic books and all the rest of it. And so it was probably the crown of Paul's labors. And that's why this letter is rather startling. It's only 25 or 30 years um, after Paul's death, uh, and this church is in danger of ex extinction. So let's just think a little bit about some of the key dates. AD 53 through 55 would be when Paul ministered there, approximately. AD 63, Paul's letter was written to them from Rome. And now AD 95, Christ's letter to the church 30 years later, and the church, its very existence, is being threatened. Not just Paul laboring there, but Priscilla and Aquila were also there uh, laboring. If you look back at Acts 18, uh, we'll see that uh, they also were stationed there, as well as many other locations, but we find them there laboring and uh, working with Apollos. Uh, verse 24 of Acts 18 down to verse 26, it says a certain Jew named Apollos, born of Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. The man was instructed by the way of the uh, in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And so we find them there uh, laboring and uh, Aquila and Priscilla. We also uh, find that, of course, Apollos was speaking there, but we also have Timothy sent to minister there in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, they teach no other doctrine. Uh, so Timothy's there. So you got Paul, Timothy, uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, Apollos, uh, and then the Apostle John. Now, we don't have any biblical evidence for this, but we do have the evidence of church history that John spent his latter years in Ephesus uh, and died there in 100 AD. And so if you put it this way, it was an assembly that had received so much light it had a good heritage. It had the, if you like, the best teachers in the New Testament age pretty much were all there and all ministered there the word of God. And so that's why it makes Christ's verdict on this church so startling. So let's dive in to the text with that introduction behind us. So it says to the angel of the church at Ephesus, remember we said the word angel just simply means messenger. And so uh, he's the one who is going to carry this letter uh, to this church and perhaps going to be the one who delivers the message. He's going to read the message to the church. He's the messenger. And he says to the angel of the church at Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So they needed to remember that he... The Lord Jesus is the one who holds the messengers in his hand. And that's good to know because this, these were days of persecution, right? John's on the Isle of Patmos, and they are, they are receiving this letter from John. They're traveling uh, from there uh, to Ephesus, and it, it was fraught with danger. Uh, again, to be caught with Christian literature uh, was a dangerous thing. Remember going into China and, and carrying a suitcase full of Christian literature. I remember going through the security and, and praying hard, Lord, pray they won't open my bags because that would have been a very serious thing in those days to be found in the underground church or in China carrying literature. And certainly that was the case here. Uh, it was a dangerous time to be a believer, dangerous time to have these documents in your hands. 
Notice as well, uh, the Lord has, he's holding him in his right hand. He's protecting his servants, these messengers, but he also is the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And he's walking, and again, we've got to remember, he, you remember he's walking in these priestly garments, and he's walking in the midst of the seven lampstands, and he's walking judicially, judging the condition of things, assessing and examining and again, have we, I wonder if we lost the sense of his presence being in the midst of us. Uh, he, he'd been there in the midst. And not only is he in the midst, but when we see a picture of the high priest walking in a house, my mind goes back to the book of Leviticus. And remember when the, when the priest would come into a house, what was he looking for? He was looking for evidence of leprosy. And if he found any leprosy in the house, what was to happen to the house? <laughs> it was to be torn down, stone by stone. Isn't that interesting? Here's the Lord Jesus, clothed in these high priestly garments, walking through these churches. And what is he looking for? Is there any corruption here? Is there any leprosy here? Is there anything that would cause this house to be torn down, cause this lampstand to be removed? And then he says this, I know thy works uh, again they're an active serving church they're involved in serving they're, they're, there's works evident in this church they're very active in in doing work for him uh, again remember uh, paul wrote to the ephesians how they were saved by grace but uh, but but there was a path of good works laid out uh, for them from before the world began and so they were they would were serving him and actively involved in doing those works, an active serving church, and thy labor, and that word labor is laboring to the point of exhaustion, uh, falling into bed at the end of the Lord's day, exhausted from their labors, very, very commendable, uh, and the Lord notices that, and it's good to know, and isn't it interesting that, that what the Lord is going to do with this church is before he corrects them, he is going to commend them, isn't it good to always, if we have to do any correction, it's always helpful if we can, we can carry that correction on the back of commendation, right? It's always good if we, and the Lord is looking for good things to point out. And he does what, where he can, he points out the good. And it's so important to commend before condemning. Uh, need to learn this, need to learn to find good things to say about God's people. And there is many good things to say about the people of God. And so uh, that's uh, his practice. That's what he does. And Paul followed that when he's writing to the Corinthians. He talks about the good things. You come behind in no gift. And, and he, he commends them where he can commend them. And we need to do that too. Uh, we need to be those that find good things to say about the people of God. And so I know about your labor. I know about your patience. Uh, that word patience, it's uh, staying under trial and difficulty steadfast endurance with a good attitude uh, they just kept on they weren't complaining they weren't having uh, filled with self-pity they were a very very faithful church and then he goes on it says and you canst not bear them which are evil and and so they were a church that were intolerant of evil uh, a pure church a holy church in the midst of a corrupt culture swimming against the tide could not bear the evil, would not accommodate evil. They were intolerant of evil. Isn't it good to, to be like that, to be intolerant of evil? You, you could not, uh, it says, uh, bear them which are evil. But then it goes on. Thou hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not, and have found them liars so again they they were they were not just um, allowing somebody to come in and claim apostolic authority without testing them remember in the early church the part of the foundation of the early church foundation of the apostles and prophets and so uh, there, were, there were genuine apostles, but there were also false apostles. Paul warns about false apostles, evil workers. And so this church, they tested everything by the word of God. And if they didn't measure up, they called them liars. 
And so he says, you tried them which say they're apostles and are not, they're false, and has found them to be liars. And of course, they were taking Paul's instructions very seriously. They're, they're a separated people. They're careful to examine visiting ministers, visiting servants that traveled in the early church. Uh, let's just see uh, Second John. We just see that this was kind of fairly common for visiting uh, preachers to travel around the early church and give ministry. And so it says in Second John 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, for, but that we receive a full reward. Whoever transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. So there were these traveling men that went around, and some of them were false. And uh, so they, we had to, there had to be this uh, this testing. Uh, this uh, do they teach the truth about the person and work of Christ? Uh, are they genuine? Uh, back in Acts twenty, Paul had warned them these very Ephesian elders about the danger of error and false teaching and the need for discernment. And they took it very seriously. Verse 28, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock. Uh, this is Acts 20, 28, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves Enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And so you could say that these uh, believers were hot on truth. And they anybody that came that was a bit suspect, they tried them and they exposed them. And so, because we recognize Satan does have his false ministers. And the church must be constantly alert to detect them and to reject them. In our day, uh, what I call YouTube theology, and I have to be careful because I have a YouTube channel, but there's a lot of stuff on YouTube and it's not good. And the people of God need great discernment and they need to test things. Is this really true or is it false? Or, uh, and again, uh, everything has to be held up to the word. Be a Berean, search the scriptures, see if these things are so. And we need that in our generation. And the church at Ephesus, well, they were hot on doctrine. Hardworking, faithful, hot on doctrine, and just amazing in many ways. So commendable and has borne and has patience. And for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Again, he commends them. Patience, sticking at it, steadfast, uh, for his name and his reputation, they had not become weary in 40 years of faithful service. And so, again, I think if we just stop there, we would say, all of us, to a man, wow, that sounds like a great assembly. I would love to visit the church at Ephesus. And yet, here's the amazing thing. The one whose eyes are like a flame of fire, what does he see? He says, nevertheless... I have somewhat against thee, thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come back unto thee quickly, and remove thy lampstand out of its place, except thou repent. The Lord soberly tells this church with a great history, and a great heritage that unless they repented speedily, their lampstand would be removed. Just one thing was wrong, but it was so serious, it jeopardized everything. And it's simply this, first love. What we might call the espousal, the, the betrothal love. Uh, one of the uh, things about this kind of love is excitement, right? When you're newly uh, engaged or in courtship or just starting out a relationship, there's an excitement, a longing to be together. 
Uh, and of course, uh, Paul had mentioned it to the, the Ephesians, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, this, this, this love relationship. 30 years earlier, he'd mentioned that. But love can take on a lesser quality in marriage. Something can be lost. Uh, perhaps the busyness of life crowds out that first love. Law is more interested. Let me just say this very cautiously and carefully. The Lord is more in interested in a love relationship than he is a labor force. And just let that sink into us. The Lord is more interested in a love relationship than a labor force. The church at Ephesus was a very faithful labor force, but it had left its first love. This busy, sacrificing church suffered from heart trouble. They'd abandoned their first love. They displayed works and labor and patience, but there was something missing. Compare them uh, with their reference to uh, their love for Christ and all the rest of it. Let's compare it with First um, Thessalonians, their labor for Christ, should I say. First Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. See, there's two types of labor, isn't there? You can do labor, but you can also do it as a labor of love. Uh, remember, an, an example of that would be uh, when um, Jacob was working for seven years uh, for Rachel. If you remember, it said it just seemed like a few days for the love that he had. Uh, for Rachel and so sometimes uh, we can we can work and we can work hard but we're not doing it out of love and certainly this is what's going on here what he's getting at is this there comes a point where we move from delight to duty we're doing things out of delight rather than out of duty and that's what is happening in the church at Ephesus they're doing everything They've got the duty part down, but they've lost the delight. They've lost the fact that they're doing it because of a love relationship with the Lord Jesus. What we do for the Lord is important, but so is the why we do it. It's possible to serve and sacrifice and suffer for my name's sake and yet not really love Jesus Christ. The Ephesian believers were so busy maintaining their separation that they were neglecting adoration. Labor is no substitute for love. Neither is purity a substitute for passion. The church must have both if it is to please him. Loving devotion to Christ can be lost in the midst of active service. And certainly no amount of orthodoxy can make up for a failure to love. And so this is what the Lord sees that we might not have seen initially. And so they, they, they love, but not like they once did. They left the first love. And the tragedy is Ephesus is no more. The church with a great history is now history. It's gone doesn't exist you won't find it there you won't find a testimony there in fact all you'll find in Ephesus is ruins <laughs> and that's the tragedy and so we said this the issue is that Ephesus is no more because it failed to be honest with God about its true condition to agree with him yes we don't love you like we used to love you Lord and because of that and its failure to repent, the Lord has removed its lampstand. And we might say this, many assemblies have a great history. They've had great teaching by godly men of a former generation. But many of them are still to this moment in great danger of extinction 
unless repentance occurs. The Lord is not interested in loveless service. They were hot on doctrine and were very orthodox in many ways, but they lacked love. And again, remember when the Lord said to Simon Peter, as he recommissioned him, what did he say? Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And then he goes on to say, if you love me, you feed my lambs, you tend my flock, whatever. So we might just say this, that maybe this morning, the Lord is asking all of us this question. Do you love me? How much do you love me? I, I, do you love me like you did at the first? Or has that love waned? Do you, are you excited about being in my presence? Are you excited about uh, hearing from me from the scriptures? Even obedience to church principles. Uh, in John 14, 15, the Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's out of love for the Lord Jesus. Look back at the book of Jeremiah. See, this was a problem for the nation of Israel too. Jeremiah 2 and verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2. Go and cry in the years of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth and the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. And God says, I remember those days when you really loved me, <laughs> when, when it was that first flush love. I remember those days, but that tell Jerusalem, you're not li loving me like that anymore. You've lost it down through time. It's, it's gone. The love of first conversion had waxed cold and given place to a lifeless and formal orthodoxy. And again, how many meetings are like that? I remember when we were in Ireland and the first time we broke bread together, there's hardly a dry eye in the meeting. It was, it was so delightful, so refreshing, so thrilling. And yet it, we can do the same things and there's hardly a dry, uh, there's hardly a tear in the place. It can become stale, cold, and tearless. And going through the motions, loveless. Instead of a preparation of heart and, and an overflowing love for Christ, we might ask ourselves a question. If the Lord was right into our assembly, would he have to tell us, you don't love me like he used to love me? You need to repent. <laughs> and if you don't, I'm going to remove your lampstand. I can tell that you don't love me like you used to. Are we going through the motions? Have we become loveless? We stand, I believe, many assemblies stand at the crossroads. What is the Lord saying? Remember from whence you have fallen. Call to mind again that espousal love again. You have opted for something inferior to what you once had. Call to remembrance. And so he's got three R's here. Remember, repent, and return. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Repent and do the first works. Return to the first works. Of course, repent means change your mind. It means um, it always results in a change of action. But, but it's just being honest with God. You're right. You're right, Lord. We're wrong. You, you're right. Do your first works. Go back to what you did when it was first love again. What was my relationship with the word of God when I was first saved? Was there that anticipation and excitement when I opened the scriptures every day? Uh, what was it like to the place of prayer, the delight of being able to speak to God who I'd been separated from for so long and just to enjoy communion with him? What was it like to, to fellowship with God's people, just to sing uh, the songs of Zion and be together with the people of God, the excitement? You could hardly wait till the midweek meeting. There was that eagerness. Uh, you didn't want to miss anything. Uh, that That eagerness to share your faith because this is so good. You want everybody to know it. Uh, this is what first love looks like. 
constantly praising and worshiping, singing uh, uh, with grace and melody in your hearts. Uh, he says, go back to that. See, that love relationship is right where we left it. Just waiting for us to pick it up again. And that's what he wants. The church that loses its love will soon lose its light. No matter how doctrinally sound it is, the Lord says, I will come. Remember from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand. It's not speaking of his second coming. Uh, I will come in judgment and remove your lampstand. The glorious city of Ephesus is today but a heap of stones and there's no light shining there at all. It's in the dark. He goes on and says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So we've got to understand who are these Nicolaitans. They're mentioned twice in these letters to the churches. Uh, we've got here, uh, you um, hate uh, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And later on, we're going to see the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So he says, you hate this. And the Lord says, so do I. I also hate this deeds of the Nicolaitans. So who are these people and what are they guilty of? Now, most commentators admit freely that really very little is known about this group. And so assumptions are made. And one of the, the general assumptions is if you look back to Acts chapter six, Acts chapter six, remember the, the, the seven deacons, as they're often called, or these, uh, these men who were called to these ministers uh, to minister to the, the widows, that one of them was Nicholas. And so it tells us in verse five of Acts six, the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And so they say, well, it was Nicholas of Antioch, one of the seven, and he began to teach the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, and uh, it and it's held, of course, the the deeds here, the doctrine in Pergamos, but it was sexual immorality uh he he basically was uh well he was immoral and he taught immoral practices it's hardly fair on nicholas of antioch because there's not a shred of evidence anywhere that he was immoral it's just pure assumption trying to find out who these nicolaitans were and because there's a guy called nicholas the assumption is oh it must be uh, must be connected with him and again, you won't find anything in history about this. So <laughs> another reason why it's very unlikely that uh, this is speaking of sexual immor immorality is because when we see the church at Pergamos, uh, where we read about uh, this uh, Nicolaitan doctrine, verse 15, so hast thou also them, this is chapter 2, verse 15, that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I thing I hate. Well, in the previous verse, verse 14, I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. So would the Lord be saying to this church, you're guilty of the doctrine of Balaam, which was teaching the children of Israel sexual immorality. Remember going in uh, with the Midianite women. And now, verse 15, is he going to say sexual immorality again with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Hardly likely. And so it seems to me that it's a non-starter to call it sexual immorality and to accept that viewpoint. So the only thing we're left with is basing our understanding on the etymology of the word. And the etymology of the word is that it's a compound word, Nicolaitans, 
and it's a mixture of two words, one of them we're familiar with. It's this word nikeo or nike, uh, which is throughout the book, the overcomer, the conqueror. Um, and so uh, the idea is conquering and then uh, laetans is from the word laos, from which we get the word laity. And so it, it just means the peoples. And so the etymology of the word would give us this, the conquering of the people, the subduing of the people, the, the pushing down of the people. And that certainly fits with the early church uh, days uh, already. Um, we saw uh, in the epistles of John that there was an individual called Diotrephes who loved to have the preeminence amongst them. And that Diotrephes syndrome, this idea of, of people feeling that they were preeminent over the saints and they had a place of higher kind of, again, this clergy laity kind of mentality. I think it's fair to say that the churches we associate with do not hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. In other words, we don't believe in a clergy laity distinction because we believe that every believer is a priest <clears throat> unto God. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so we don't, we don't accept that. But if we're really honest, we do have a problem with the deeds of the Nicolaitans in that there are many assemblies that struggle and suffer under what I would call Diotrephes leadership. And often Diotrephes leadership, sometimes we call them bull elders um, or CEOs, chief elders operating. Uh, lots of names for these individuals. <clears throat> but these people, how do they get that way? Is it that they wake up one day and say, I want to have the preeminent place in this church? Oftentimes, it's because others fail to take responsibility. And so somebody starts out, just somebody's got to do this, so they do it, and then they get used to doing it, and they, they end up making all the decisions. And, and so oftentimes, it's the ineptitude of others that allows diotrephes to rise up. And even when they begin to rise up, what's needed is men that will challenge them, hold them account accountable, but they get to the stage where it's almost they almost become like popes in the meetings that they're in. And Lord deliver us from this. Lord hates this. Why does he hate it? Why does he hate this deeds and doctrines of the Nicolaitans? Because the only person who is to have preeminence in the local assembly is him, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And it's so hated because it's taking the place that belongs to the Lord as head of the church. It's, it's assuming his position. And uh, the Lord hates that. And so, again, we're not immune. And many assemblies, on, and I've come across it on different continents, are the children of God are chafing, chafing under Diotrephes leadership. And so, Lord, deliver us from either becoming like that or allowing that to take place because of our unwillingness to be the man and to stand up and say, no, we can't have that. Look at verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What is the Spirit saying? Several churches represented here uh, on this Zoom meeting. Is the Lord saying anything to any of us? Or maybe even individually, because he talks about the overcomer. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Not so, so it's an individual here. Maybe the Lord is asking us, how is your love relationship with me today? Do you love me like you used to love me? Or has it grown cold? You're still serving me. You're still busy. You're still active. I know that. And I know you, you work hard. But I'm not looking for a labor force. I just want a love relationship first and anything you do to come out of you, the fact you love me. And so do you love me? Not Simon, son of Jonah, but put your name there. Whatever your name is, ask yourself this question. If the Lord was asking you directly today, do you love me? How would you answer that? 
Well, I do laud, but not like I used to. Oh, I was madly in love in the early days. I was so thankful that you'd save me and I just loved you. But I got busy. God wants us to be honest. He says to him that overcometh, I'm going to give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What an amazing promise for the overcomer to eat of the tree of life. Now, of course, it's mentioned again in Revelation 22. You might just look there for a second. And verse 2, it says, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which hath twelve manner of fruits, and yieldeth her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So to eat of the real tree of life, that's the promise, of which Eden's tree was only a figure, is to be as filled with divine love as a creature can possibly be. <laughs> that's, I think that's what he's talking about, to just enjoy such intimacy with the Lord. Now, how does this relate to the Garden of Eden? Well, like the Garden of Eden, in this letter, there's labor. Do you remember Adam was working in the garden? There was a reference to walking. Remember, the Lord is the one walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And there's a threat of removal. Garden of Eden, remember? There was a threat of removal. There was the presence of evil. In this letter, you know those that are evil. There's liars. There was a liar in the garden. There's a reference to fallen, from where you were fallen. All of these phrases, you, you might say there's echoes of Eden here, right? Echoes of Eden. And of course, the thing that seals it is the reference to the tree of life. And so there was a day when Adam enjoyed intimacy with God. He walked with God. There was a, a, a fresh first love relationship. But things came in, and there was a fall, and there was a removal, and it all came crashing down. And so we might ask ourselves the question this morning. Very important question. How is your love relationship with the Lord Jesus? Do you love me? He says, I hope we do. I hope we love him like we did at the beginning. But it's very easy to still be busy for the Lord, but not madly in love with the Lord. And everything we do needs to be out of love for him. So may the Lord encourage us with this first letter to the churches.